Okie dokie smokies. Here we go. So the United States is now in the war. We're in the great World War II. And um, things begin to change in the United States. World War II is really the first or the last, I should say, total war that the United States has ever been involved in. And by total war, I mean everybody in the country, young and old, male and female, um, everybody feels the effects and the impacts of the war. Everybody's lives in the, in, in the country um, has their lives changed in some way by the war. Last total war. We haven't had one since World War II. So this is a pretty remarkable war. Um, on the screen here, you see a couple of uh, different um, posters, propaganda posters from World War II. On the left, you see uh, your typical stereotypical American children, and they're out playing, and um, the shadow of the swastika is beginning to come down on them. And it says, don't let that shadow touch them by war bonds. So war bonds were uh, things that uh, the government sold, and there were big uh, productions of celebrities that go out and encourage people to buy war bonds. And basically what it was is that people would buy bonds from the United States government, and it was like loaning money to the government to go fight the war because wars are expensive. So this was people loaning money to the government. They'd buy these bonds, and then the government promised, you know, hopefully if they win, um, in 10 years, they'll pay the people back plus interest. So you're buying these bonds, loaning money to the government, and the government's going to pay you back with interest um, after some period of time. On the right, you see uh, a family, dad's protecting the family, and it says, this world cannot exist half slave and half free, which was a quote by um, from Winston Churchill. And it says, sacrifice for freedom. And you see guys getting whipped, and there's a claw coming up from behind to grab dad. And um, the idea was that um, people in the United States, this is part of the total war effort. People in the United States were expected to sacrifice things that they did. They were expected to sacrifice the amount of food that they ate, the amount of gas that they consumed, the amount of um, uh, goods and services that the United States consumed. We were, uh, Americans were, con were expected to use less so that more could be sent overseas to the soldiers. So that's what that uh, propaganda poster means. Uh, sacrifice for freedom, right? You know, if you sacrifice here, you're not going to live in fear because bad guys are going to come and dominate the country. All right, so let's get into it. World War II society on the home front. Um, for the most part, pretty much every single minority group, with the exception of one, and we'll talk about them, every single minority group in the United States somehow, some way benefited from World War II. Their lives got better as a result of World War II. African Americans, um, for the most part, were, were no different in this. They, uh, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, benefit African Americans during World War II. For instance, they were allowed to join the Marines for the very first time. Before this, African Americans were not allowed to join the Marines at all. During World War II, they changed that. Now, the reason they changed it, uh, obviously a pretty obvious reason, they needed soldiers, right? And this was a way to get more soldiers uh, to join the Marines. Now, they were still segregated. There were still white troops. There were still black troops. The, the equipment, the materials, the uniforms, the living conditions, everything for the black troops was inferior to what the white troops got. But... For the first time, they're allowed to join the Marines. The Marines, for the first time, begin to allow African Americans to join them. Uh, they're allowed to join. They're allowed to fly in combat for the first time. Uh, African Americans had never been allowed to fly planes in combat, and now they were. There is a, uh, a specific flying unit specifically for African Americans called uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. And their flying, their, their fighter planes were called red tails. 
because the tails of their planes were painted red. Uh, this becomes one of the highest decorated um, combat troops during World War II. That is also the only fighting, uh, flying fighting unit during World War II not to have a plane shot down. The Tuskegee Airmen Red Tails were the only ones not to lose a plane in combat during World War II. Oh, that's pretty cool. We also get our first uh, black U.S. general during World War II. This guy here, name is Brigadier Benjamin Davis. He's mostly in the Pacific, uh, and he's leading uh, only black troops. We don't have integrated troops yet. That'll come uh, a little later in the 1940s under President Truman. So he's leading uh, African-American troops in the combat, but he is our first general in the United States military who uh, is, is not white. So that, that's pretty exciting. That's pretty good news. But perhaps the biggest impact for African-Americans in the United States overall comes in terms of their ability to get jobs. And during World War II, we have what's known as black migration. And what it is, is that there's this um, a very large number of African-Americans who begin to move from the South. Okay? Prior to World War II, around 80% of the uh, African-American population in the United States all lived in the South. They were still there kind of from the Civil War. During World War II, there is this huge movement of uh, blacks out of the South to the North. And they go to the North because this is where all the factories are. And there's lots and lots of jobs there, right? Remember, World War II is what ends the Great Depression because all of a sudden there's this huge demand for supplies, right? We've got to make weapons. We've got to make um, um um, vehicles and planes and ships and bombs. And there's this huge demand for war material, which kicks all of these factories, which had been, you know, kind of shut down for the most part during uh, the Great Depression. All of a sudden they come back to life and are making things for the war uh, effort. And a lot of the guys that had jobs there who were lucky enough to have a job, a lot of them have now been drafted and they're in the, in the army. So those jobs need to be filled. In addition to that, because of this huge increased output during World War II, there's new jobs being created. So there's a lot of blacks who move out of the South to the North to fill these jobs. Okay, And a lot of Northern cities, Denver included, has their black population more than doubled during World War II, right? Denver doesn't really have a very large African-American population prior to World War II. Our African-American population more than doubles during World War II because there is an, uh, a very large uh, war industry here in Denver called Gates Rubber Plant. It's not really around anymore. The building is still there. You can still see the, the old factory. It's now a, an office building. It's on I-25 and Broadway. On just to the south of I-25 on Broadway there. It's the old Gates Rubber Factory. At that time, Gates uh, was one of the largest rubber manufacturers in the world. So during the war, there's this huge demand for tires and for belts and for hoses and uh, for straps and things like that for uh, that, that required a lot of uh, rubber. So Gates Rubber Company becomes this huge war industry and it attracts a lot of African-Americans in Denver. And we see our, our population more than double. Okay. Now, as African-Americans begin making more money than they had ever had before, the um, inequities in society become even more pronounced, right? It, it becomes very obvious that there are uh, real differences between how white Americans are living and how black Americans are living because now they're making more money. So now they can go out to dinner and they can go out to uh, other, you know, public events um, 
because they can afford it now. And as they're going out, they're realizing they're, it's a very segregated society. So the inequities and the segregation between whites and blacks become even more evident as they begin to make more money and have the ability to go out and do more things. As a result of this, membership in uh, equal rights organizations and renewed interest in civil rights begins to rise. And we see membership in, in organizations such as the NAACP begin to go up uh, a lot. Now, not everything is hunky-dory. Okay? As the number of black workers increased in the factories, so did a lot of resentment and a lot of anger towards uh, black workers in the workplace begin to increase as well. And we begin to get some really, really, really tense, very bad situations begin to take place in workplaces uh, around the country. The worst place, the most uh, prominent example of this happens in Detroit. In Detroit, which is where all the auto manufacturers are, right? That's where Ford is, it's where General Motors is, it's where Chrysler is. All the um, auto manufacturers in the country are all based in Detroit. And <clears throat> they're producing a lot of stuff. They're building ships and tanks and planes and, and other ve war vehicles, right? Um, so if somebody buys you just by the way, if someone tells you, oh, I've got a great deal on a 43 Ford for you, tell them, oh, you, you big galaya, because there is no 43 Ford made, right? During World War II, all uh, vehicles for all cars for public consumption, just regular everyday cars, they don't make them anymore. They've stopped making cars to be sold to the general public because all they're doing now is making war material ships and planes and, and bombs and, and um, other uh, tanks and things like that. So anyways, in Detroit, in these auto manufacturing plants, uh, there was a large number of whites who were not happy about having to work next to a black person, who were angry that, gosh, this black person may have taken a job from a white person who could have used this job. So there was a strike that takes place in Detroit to protest a number of, of um Blacks that, that are being hired. And in the picture here, you, you can see what's happening in the picture. This is at a Ford uh, factory in Detroit. And what was happening is that the auto manufacturers would send out buses into black neighborhoods because they weren't allowed to live in the white neighborhoods. And the black neighborhoods usually were way far away from the factories. So they would send buses out to pick up the black workers and bring them into the factory. And when this riot, when this strike takes place, which turns into a riot, um, white workers were in the parking lot waiting for these buses to come, come in with the black workers. And when the buses pulled in, the white workers would force open the bus and they would drag the blacks out of the bus and just beat the bejesus out of them. Okay, So this strike ends with three days of rioting. And at the end of the, the three days of rioting in Detroit that basically shut down the city, 25 blacks and nine whites have been killed. Okay? The only reason this ends is because Roosevelt has to send in the army to basically patrol the streets like, a, like an occupied city. <clears throat> so there's armed soldiers and uh, tanks and things rolling up and down the streets of Detroit to stop the rioting. Okay. Similar riots take place, not on as big or as, um, um, yeah, as, as big a scale as it did in Detroit, but there are similar riots that take place in, in places like Denver, Chicago, St. Louis, Indianapolis. All of these cities see the number of uh, blacks in their cities, African Americans, more than double during World War II, and there's a lot of resentment and anger about this. Now, the most famous race riot of the time, the most famous uh, riot of World War II involves a very different ethnic group in a very different city for very different reasons. This uh, very famous riot involves these people.
The Hispanic populations in large southwestern cities, western and southwestern cities like Denver, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and San Diego, begin to rapidly expand as well, okay, for the exact same reasons. Um, a lot of the Hispanic population in the United States is really in the very extreme southern parts of the, the southwest. And during World War II, all of a sudden there's all these jobs in these factories and other war-related industries. And so we begin to see this migration of Hispanic populations from the extreme southern uh, southwest into places like Denver, Los Angeles, Phoenix. And so the Hispanic populations in these cities begin to rapidly expand, just like they did in northern cities with African Americans. Okay? And they're coming up here to take advantage of these really good jobs, these war industry jobs. Okay? And young Hispanic men who uh, haven't been drafted or won't be drafted for various reasons, they're making more money than they had ever imagined that they could. They're making more money than their parents are. They're making more money than their parents ever had. And they've got this money, you know, to kind of, they, they want to show that they've got money. You guys know how it is, right? You guys get some money in your pocket and you're not going to go clink, 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 put the money in the bank. Oh, nay, nay. That money's going to burn a hole in your pocket. Like you got to spend that money. You want to, you know, spend the money. And same with these young guys. So they want to go spend their money. Problem is, because of World War II, there's not a lot of things out there to spend their money on, right? They can't go buy a car because there's new cars are not being produced. So people that own a car during World War II probably are not selling it because it's really hard for them to go get another car. So they have to find, these young guys have to find other ways to show off their newfound wealth. And what they end up doing is that they adopt a very loud, very flashy, um, very expensive style of dress, a very distinctive style of dress. And it's very expensive and it's very noticeable. I mean, it, the, the style of dress really stands out. So here's what uh, they would buy. This is what their, their, their dress would look like, right? And it was uh, to show off their money, a very distinctive style of dress. They'd have a broad brimmed hat, right? They'd, on, on the top, they would have a very broad brimmed hat or fedora, right? Or if they didn't have a hat, they would just slick back their hair. Okay. They would just put some uh, gel, like kind of like gel in their hair called Brill Cream, put it in their hair and they would just comb their hair straight back. They'd wear a long waisted coat. So the, 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 the coat, instead of ending just below their waist, like most coats do, would go down to about mid thigh level. And it was broad shoulders. So the shoulders were larger, were a little bit larger than their actual shoulders, right? So the, the coat kind of extended beyond their, their actual shoulders. They'd wear a broad collar, so it was a wide collar, and uh, they wouldn't button it up, right? They would leave the top collar unbuttoned, and um, they would lay the, the, the collar of the shirt on top of their coat. They'd wear baggy, not crazy baggy, like, you know, guys wear today where your crotch is hanging down to your knee and you have to walk like a penguin to keep your pants up, right? But they were loose baggy pegged pants. So pegged pants are pants that kind of, as they come down the leg, they get tighter around the ankle. Okay. So they're kind of wide up around the thigh and then they come down to the ankle and, and they begin to get uh, tighter around the ankle. And then they would have a watch or a wallet or sometimes nothing at all connected to a long chain that would connect to one of their front belt loops. And the chain would come down almost to their knee and then come back up into their back pocket. And then they would wear these thick, heavy-soled shoes, kind of like Doc Martin, old Doc Martin shoes, right? They're very thick, heavy-soled shoes. So this is what they look like. A zoot suit! Okay, these are zoot suiters. Very expensive. The colors were very loud, and they very often they would clash. It was a very distinctive style of dress for young Hispanic men. Cost a lot of money to dress like this. Now... Here's where the problem comes in. These guys begin to adopt zoot suits as well. 
in Los Angeles, young Hispanic street gangs begin to adopt a zoot suit for their dress as well. Okay, so now it becomes people come to believe that since all gangbangers are wearing zoot suits, then all zoot suiters must be gangbangers. <laughs> Now, you guys know that's not true, right? Just because everybody who's in a gang is wearing a zoot suit doesn't mean everybody who wears a zoot suit is in a gang. But to the general public mind during World War II, that's what was happening. If you were wearing a zoot suit, you were in a gang, okay? And it even goes so far as the Los Angeles City Council even uh, – seriously debates, seriously talks about outlawing all zoot suits in the city and county of Los Angeles, like making it against the law to wear a zoot suit. <laughs> so here's how all, all of this tension around zoot suits and street gangs begin to build up. And in 1943, there's a dance hall in Los Angeles. A dance hall is like a club except, you know, they don't have a DJ or whatever. They have an actual band. And there are a lot of military installations, Army and Navy, around Los Angeles. There are a lot of military bases around Los Angeles. So at this particular club, uh, at this particular dance hall, it was about half and half. Half were military, half were zoot suiters. Some of the zoot suiters were certainly gang members. So in 1943, uh, this zoot suitor, went up to the girlfriend of one of the soldiers and asked her to dance. And she goes, ah, you know, I'm here with my boyfriend, you know, thanks, but no thanks. You know, I just want to be hanging out with my boyfriend. And um, the boyfriend comes back, the soldier comes back, and he tells the zoot suitor, look, you know, she didn't want to dance with you. There's lots of other girls here. Why don't you go ask one of them to dance and leave my girlfriend alone? Well, then, you know, words are exchanged. And... Um, it turns into your typical guy fight with the guys flapping their arms like a chicken. You know, well, I'm not going to throw the fuck at you. And they're calling each other's names. They're kind of walking around, flapping their arms and calling each other names and daring each other to throw the first punch. And, you know, just the silliness of, of guy fights. And then eventually the guy fight turns into a chick fight where they like actually go at each other and they're throwing blows and everything. So the, the, the soldier, he's a sailor, punches the zoot suitor, knocks him down. Now this zoot suitor happens to be a member of a gang. And he comes up and stabs the soldier. And then it's on. Okay. Once the zoot suitor stabs the soldier, the other soldiers in the, um, dance hall go after all the other zoot suitors in the dance hall and it just turns into this massive riot that spills out into the street okay now because this is a military town word begins to spread very quickly throughout the military bases and throughout the city about what had just happened a hispanic gang banging zoot suitor stabbed a soldier and it was on and it gives us the zoot suits, zoot suit riots. This is known as the zoot suit riots. So here's what happens. Okay. As word begins to spread throughout uh, Los Angeles, soldiers and other people just load up in cars and begin randomly driving the streets of Los Angeles looking for anybody who's wearing a zoot suit. And when they find them, they would pull over and they would just beat the bejesus out of the zoot suitor, right? And you can see that happening in the picture here. This is a zoot suitor they found out on the street and they jumped out and you can see the guy's got a bat and he's about to just, you know, waylay this guy. So then the zoot suitors, of course, retaliate and they go after the, the soldiers and it just becomes this very chaotic weekend in Los Angeles. Woof. But again, for the most part, Hispanics, like African Americans, definitely see their lives improve as a result of World War II and this demand for uh, war materials, which creates this demand for uh, increase in jobs and good paying jobs and so on and so forth. Now, the one group 
who definitely do not have their lives improve. One group. And let's talk about it. It happens because of this. Executive Order 9066. And there it is. It's all about Japanese. Roosevelt signs this into law on February 19, 1942. Pearl Harbor has just happened about two months prior to this. And there was this fear that the Japanese, that Pearl Harbor was just the beginning. And the Japanese were in the process of planning an attack and an invasion into the western part of the United States, which really was not all that far off, right? The Japanese definitely were planning this, and this was something the Japanese definitely wanted to do, but they weren't, they had a long way to go before they could actually do that, right? They had, you know, other things that they had to take care of before they could actually get to the shores of, of the United States. But there was this real fear in the United States. People were terrified of this. And people in the United States become, uh, begin to believe that all Japanese people living in the country were spies for Japan and were helping the Japanese plan and carry out this attack. So this was Executive Order 9066 was about keeping this from happening. Okay? It orders all Americans living west of the Mississippi that are 1 16th, 1 16th. Japanese, that's hardly anything. One sixteenth Japanese to report to a local quote unquote internment camp where they would remain for the rest of the war. Oof. Okay. Now, we don't have internment camps, so we have to build them. Okay. So in the meantime, Japanese are going to be placed into holding camps where we can keep an eye on them because we can't just let the Japanese, you know, roam around because who knows what they'll do. So they ordered a Japanese to be put into holding camps. And uh, these holding camps usually were in old stockyards or on the floors of stadiums or in arenas. Here in Denver, if you guys have ever been to the stock show and you go down kind of in the basement, to the, the, the animal stalls where they keep the horses and the pigs and the cows and all the animals and stuff. If you go down in there, that's where they kept the Japanese. Okay, They put them into the animal stalls, and that's where the Japanese families lived until they could build these internment camps. And these internment camps were just these huge camps with 10-foot tall barbed wire fences surrounding them. And every... I don't know, 100 yards or so, there was a guard tower with armed soldiers in the guard tower watching the Japanese in the camps. And the soldiers had orders to shoot to kill anybody who tried to get out. Oh, boy. The internment camp that was built here in Colorado is in Granada, Colorado. Now, if you guys have never been to Colorado, uh, Granada, Colorado. Oh, you're missing out. It's in the most beautiful part of the state. You've never heard of it. It's down in the southeastern corner of the state. I mean, it's right down by the Kansas Oklahoma border. Oh, beautiful part of the state. Okay. Oh, there's a picture of it. That's Camp Amachi. That's that was the Japanese internment camp in uh, Granada, Colorado. And you can see what. You know, what's there, right? It's flat, right? There's nothing there. There's no trees. And this is a horrific part of the state. But they put the Japanese there because they were so, at, at that time, still today, but especially in 1942, this was so far away from, um, from any large population center. So they were like out in the boonies. Okay. So it's located, Granada is located in the southeastern corner of the state, Camp Amachi. Okay. And these camps, they're basically shacks okay, that are surrounded by hard wire, hard barbed wire fences with bar, armed guards and so on and so forth. I told you, you know, like I told you. And you can look at these cabins here, at these, at these huts. 
So in these, there's probably, looks like there's three different living units in there and probably, probably somewhere in a neighborhood of 20, 15 to 20 people living in, in, uh, in that, in those three buildings, in those three living spaces there. Holy cow, right? Most Japanese will remain in these camps until the end of the war. That's how long they're kept there. Now, young Japanese men could get out, but the only way that they could get out of the internment camp was to volunteer to fight um, in World War II. And if they did that, then almost all of them were sent to the Pacific to fight the Japanese. Finally, in 1995, the United States government uh, formally apologized to, um, to the people who you know, were put in the internment camps. And uh, they agreed to pay their survivors or the descendants of, their, uh, of these camps reparations, damages for what they, you know, what they went through. Um, gosh, when I first started teaching about 20 years ago, I had a girl in class and her mother's dad was in an internment camp and he had died, um, you know, since then. So her mother got this letter from Bill Clinton uh, who was president at that time, apologizing for her dad being putting, put into an internment camp. And she got a check from the government. And then that check was then being used to help fund her daughter go through college. Well, there you go. All right. So obviously that doesn't go well for him. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys. You can go see Camp Amachi today. It's now a national historic site. And here's the cool thing. The people who are restoring it and the people who are taking care of Camp Amachi and the people who lead the tours through Camp Amachi and the people who are doing the history of Camp Amachi are the students, the U.S. history students at Granada High School. That's their entire class. Their entire American history class is um, preserving, protecting, and um being the caretaker caretakers of uh, Camp Amachi. So if you go down there, there you go to Camp Amachi, there's a little sign on the on the gate and it said, uh, for a tour, call this number and you call the number. Well, it's a cell phone that's kind of passed around to students at Granada High School. And you get a hold of a student and the student says, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be right out there. And then a student comes out and they take you through Camp Amachi. Kind of cool, right? All right, so of all the people the minority groups that benefited from World War II, the one that benefited the most, and it's not even close, that benefited the most from World War II are women. Women benefit more from World War II than any other minority group during World War II. Okay. Um, now, women are not allowed into combat in World War II. They're not allowed to go off and fight the war. But every branch of the military had a job, had a uh, special part of their uh, military for women, right? Army had a special branch just for women. The Navy had special branch just for women. The Marines had special branch just for women. And all of, and the women that, that enlisted in the military and then went to these um, different branches, all of them played a really, really important job. Okay. For instance, this woman that you see in the picture here, she's part of the, she's a WASP, okay, Women's Air Force Service Pilots. So here's what she would do, okay. Women who enlisted in the WASP, Women's Air Force Service Pilots, they figured out how to operate the planes, like what the planes could do, how to operate the, um, the, the weaponry, how to open up the, the bomb doors, how to you know, operate the machine guns, how, uh, what, what the plane can and cannot do in flying, how fast it can go, how, you know, uh, what airspeed you need to be to come in and land, all that stuff. Women figure that out. And then they would teach the men how to do that. 
And that's what they would do in all of these other military branches, right? We're producing all these new war materials and all these new war machines. And women were the ones that figured out how to make them work and what they did. And then they would teach it to the men who are actually going to take it into combat. So that would, that's pretty cool. But women play an even more important role. And the biggest impact of women in the United States during World War II is not in the military. It's in the workforce. This is where women really, really play a, a major role in, a, uh, in World War II. Women joined the workforce in extraordinarily large numbers. There's even a, a huge uh, government propaganda campaign encouraging women to go enlist in the military, telling women, do your patriotic duty, go get a J-O-B, right? Because your boyfriend, your brother, your son, your husband, they're in the military, they're in the army, they're all fighting, right? And they're depending on you to make the things for them to make their uniforms, to make sure they have food, make sure they have bullets, right? They're depending on you. Go do your job as an American citizen and get a job in the workforce to support the war, okay? So men had joined the military and they had all these factory jobs that needed to be filled, okay? And women did everything that the men did, right? Women welded, they riveted, which is what the woman in the picture is doing. That's putting the, the like, they're like bolts that hold together sheet metal and stuff like that. They uh, riveted, they cut steel, they put together tanks and planes and ships and bombs, other war materials, right? They did everything that the men did. And then it was found out during this time that some of these jobs, women did better than the men did. <laughs> That's crazy. What? Women can do some of these jobs better than the men could? Whoa. In particular, they found out that women were better welders than men. Women made better, stronger welds than men made. Huh. Now, when I asked, if you guys were in class, I asked you, why was that? And usually I get answered, well, because women are, you know, take their time or women pay more attention or things like that. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with their physical size. Women's bodies and hands are usually smaller than men's. And when you're doing welding, it's usually in a pretty tight, narrow, small spot. So women, because of their small, you know, uh, physical size, were able to get closer to that spot. So their welds were stronger and better than men's. <laughs> Who knew? The government, as I told you, had this, pa as this propaganda campaign encouraging women to go out and do their patriotic duty and get a job, right? And you guys have seen some of these, right? There's this one here. The girl she left behind him is still behind him. She's a wow, a women ordinance worker, right? And so you look at her in the picture like, you know, she's got the wrench and she goes, she's thinking of her boyfriend and this bomb's for you, baby. And then the most famous one, right? You guys have all seen this before. Rosie the Riveter, right? The woman flexing her muscles. We can do it, right? So this was a poster encouraging women to go get a job right? That women are just as good as men. Go get a job. All right. So I told you guys at the beginning that World War II was a total war. It affected everybody during, the, uh, uh, during World War II. And this is how it affects everybody, including children. Through this process known as rationing. And rationing means that you limit the amount of stuff that you can buy, okay? So you, you limit the amount of stuff that you can buy. The idea is if we, lose le if we use less here, more can be sent overseas, right? So everybody um, would get what was known as a ration book. Once a month, you would go down to the local rationing office, this government rationing office, and you would get like a coupon book. And in this coupon book 
were stamps that have numbers on them. Okay. And um, the stamps, you can kind of see some of the numbers on the stamps here. Those stamps represent point values. And everything that you bought had a point value. So when you would buy food, you would, in addition to paying, you would have to turn over stamps and the points on your stamps would have to add up to the point value of all the food that you showed. I'll show you what it looks like here in a minute, right? So everything is rationed, food, sugar, uh, meat, uh, tires, gasoline, uh, heating oil, right? And there's grandma. I'm in this fight too, Sonny, right? Uh, turn down your, uh, put on a sweater, turn down your heat. So more of uh, the oil and stuff can be sent overseas to the soldiers. Okay. Nylons are, were, um, were rationed, right? It was hard to get nylons. And this was a big deal for women back then, right? Um, they don't have, um, what become known as, as pantyhose today, they have nylon stockings, right? And so women, because they're all wearing dresses, it's really important that they wear nylon stockings back then. Uh, you couldn't go out in public without your nylons on, right? Well, nylon was really, really hard to get at that time because they were using the material to make uh, belts and webbing and, and stuff like that. So women couldn't get nylon stockings back then. And this was a huge deal. Women couldn't get the, their, their nylon stockings, you know, for their dresses and stuff. And my grandma told me that when she would go out uh, with her friends to dance or whatever during World War II, to give the appearance that they had nylon stockings on, they would take mascara, eyeliner, and draw a black line up the back of their legs. So it looked like they had nylons on because nylons back then, if you've ever seen old pictures of, of women from back then, they have this black line down the back of their leg when they're wearing a dress or whatever. That was the seam from the nylon because the material for the nylon would overlap and that's where they would make the sew, make the, uh, you know, sew it together. And so to give the appearance that they were wearing nylons, they would draw a black line up the back of their leg. I don't know. So you couldn't get nylons, right? You just couldn't buy them. You could get tires once a year. You got a new set of tires. And tires back then were not as good a quality as they are today, right? They frequently blew out. Very rarely do tires blow out uh, today. They did back then. Okay, if you guys have watched a uh, Christmas story, right? When they went and got the Christmas tree, there's a uh, the tire blows out. It doesn't seem to be a big event. It's like a normal everyday event, you know. And he even says timing. He's going to go out and you know see how fast he can change the tire. Today, very rarely do tires blow out. Okay, back then they blew out a lot. They just weren't as good a quality. But to conserve on the amount of rubber and the amount of tires that are being used in the United States, you can only get one set of tires a year. And you had to have this certificate saying that you can get a new set of tires. Okay. Here's the points that I was telling you guys about. So when you would, this would be uh, something that was on the cashier register. So when you went up to pay your food, okay, you bought, say, a pound of peas for whatever reason, whatever reason you bought a pound of peas, it cost 16 points. So in addition to paying for the peas, you would have to open up your ration book. And everybody in your household had a ration book, right? From the very youngest to the very oldest in your household would have a ration book. And in that ration book were stamps with numbers on them. And um, the older you were, the more points you got. So you'd have to pay and then you'd have to give the cashier stamps from your books that added up to 16 points, right? You get um, sliced pineapple. That was 24 points. That was a lot of points. Okay. So this is what it looked like. Okay. Two pounds of tomato juice. I guess if you like tomato juice, it's 32 points. You had to pay for it and then pay 30, give, a, give over these stamps. Okay. This was a certificate saying that you could go buy sugar. Back then, people baked all the time. So sugar was really important, right? So this allowed you to go get sugar. And here's some of the stamps. These are kind of what some of the stamps look like. You can see they have different values, right? This is worth five points. This is worth two points. 
Uh, this one here is worth 32 points. So you would, in your ration books, which looks like this, if you guys were in class, I've got ration books that I would show you guys that my grandma had. They would come in a ration book that looked like this, and you open it up, and here's the stamps. And then you would give these to the cashier or whomever. Okay, gas was rationed. Okay, most people, if you had a car, you would get this sticker in your window, this A sticker, meaning that you got four gallons of gas a week. That was it. Okay, so when you went to the gas station, and back then you didn't pump your own gas, they had gas station attendants who would come out and give you, you know, pump your gas. They would come out and they would see that sticker. They knew you could only get four gallons of gas, and you'd have to give them a ration stamp with the date of that week saying that you could get your four gallons of gas that week. You got your four gallons of gas, and then you went out cruising around and going all over town, and you burn up your four gallons of gas. You be walking until next week because you ain't getting no more gas, right? Now, if you were a doctor or somebody like that who had to drive a lot, back then doctors came to see you. You didn't go see the doctor. You got this sticker, and that gave you eight gallons of gas. Hoof. So you really had to be careful because the less gas that we use here, more gas can be used overseas for the soldiers. So you really had to be careful about how much gas you actually were using. Okay. To get around rationing, people were encouraged to grow victory gardens. And this is when uh, backyard gardens kind of come back into style, right? If your family has a garden in their backyard, your family grows their own food during the summer or whatever, okay, it goes back to World War II. Because really, once we um, get through the Industrial Revolution of the late 1800s, early 1900s. Most people are living in cities, and most people don't see a need to grow their own food anymore. During World War II, because of rationing, right, people begin to grow their own food again. They begin to have their own backyard gardens because you could grow as much food as you wanted, and you could keep it, right? There is no law preventing that. Or sometimes schools or people with very large yards would grow gardens specifically to uh, grow food to add to whatever was being shipped overseas to the soldiers, right? So here's some uh, propaganda posters encouraging people to grow their own food, right? And the one woman on the left there, of course I can, right? Meaning that she cans her own foods. I'm patriotic as can be and ration points don't worry me. She can grow as much food as she wants and she didn't have to worry about rationing it. This is all the food that she wants, right? Which, again, frees up more food to be sent overseas because now she's not buying it at the store. All right, so there you go, guys. That's a really quick overview of uh, the war effort in the United States during World War II. This was a total war, meaning everybody in the country at some point in time felt the effects of this war. This war impacted and affected everybody's everyday lives somehow some way all right guys we'll talk to you guys later bye